call them change makers. Call them rule breakers. We call them redefiners. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Redefiners. I'm Simon Kingston, the Leadership Advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates. Hoda is off this week, so very excitingly, I'm joined by my colleague Emma Coombe, who many of our listeners will know as the host of our sister podcast, Leadership Lounge. Hello, Simon. Great to be with you. And before we get started, just a very quick reminder to our listeners that you can find all the episodes of both Redefiners and the Leadership Lounge on YouTube. If you're currently watching Redefiners on YouTube, just hit that subscribe button uh, below so you don't miss an episode. And for our audio listeners, don't forget to rate Redefiners whenever you get your podcasts. We love to hear your feedback. Emma, we talk a lot on Redefiners with leaders about the economy and about sustainability. And today, we get to talk to someone who leads a $20 billion organization that serves both as a great bellwether of the economy but also is serving on the front lines of our sustainability efforts. We do indeed, Simon. I'm really looking forward to talking with our guest today. He's someone who's been known to take a hands-on approach to leadership, literally rolling up his sleeves and jumping on the back of a truck with his employees who do the dirty work we often take for granted. And he's delivering phenomenal returns to his shareholders. So Emma, tell our listeners who our guest is today. Our guest today is Jim Fish, Jr., President and CEO of Waste Management. WM is the United States' top waste and recycling operator, managing about 30% of all U.S. landfill volume and going through a massive transformation to achieve its sustainability objectives. Over the course of Jim's 23-year career at WM, he's held a variety of key positions, including President, CFO, Senior Vice President for the company's Eastern Group, and Vice President of Price Management. Prior to WM, Jim held finance and revenue management positions at Westex, Transworld Airlines, and America West Airlines. Jim, welcome to Redefine Us. Thank you. Great to be here. Let's dive right in. You started your career uh, as a finance and accounting person. I did. And for all our finance and CFO listeners looking to make the transition to the CEO position. Talk to us a bit about the path to that for you. How did it take place? And what did you find on arrival at that CEO post that you needed to add? Well, one of the things that I thought was was maybe important, most important in my career was not so much that I was on the finance and accounting side, because I do think that's a, a great entry point into any company, having an understanding of, of you know, the, the, the income statement, the, the balance sheet, those things is very important. But I got some very good advice from from a guy who was CEO two CEOs ago here at WM. His name is Maury Myers, and 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 Maury said, "Look, if you want to move within the company, you should also understand the the core function of that company. And so, if you're working for a uh, you know a, a Procter and Gamble, you want to be on the marketing side at some point. And if you're working for a Goldman Sachs, you want to be on the finance side. And he said, waste management is truly at its core an operating company." And so, Emma, uh, you mentioned that I'd been on, on the back of trucks. I haven't done it uh, in the last couple of years, but I did do that as a practice when I was out in our field operations for about seven years. And going out into the field operations was, uh, was on the advice of Maury Myers because waste management is truly an operating company. What the, the, the money that we make is, is, doesn't happen uh, without any of our 48,000, but in particular, our operating team out in the field. So... While having a finance background is, is important, and I use it every day, I use my, my accounting degree every day in this current job, also understanding the, the core of the business uh, and, and what our field is doing and how valuable what they're doing is to not only um, our financial results, but also to our sustainability efforts is critical. And we're going to pick up a, a set of those themes in a moment. But first, that question of definition, you talk about trash trucks on this side of the Atlantic, they're known as bin lorries. But what did you learn? Tell us about that camp, that, that 2 a.m. start and what it told you both about the operating business but the people in it. That's a new term for me. I have to tell you, Simon, I've never heard of that term. But uh, So we definitely don't use that over here. But I think understanding um, you know, what they go through every day, I, I, the, the, maybe the one story I'll tell you is about uh, riding on the back of a truck in, outside of Pittsburgh at 2 o'clock in the morning when it was 10 degrees below zero 
to help me understand, for example, why productivity might suffer uh, in the middle of January, because you've got three feet of snow, and, and when you're picking up a, a street that has bins on the street, they might put that bin on top of the mountain of snow. They might put it behind it. And and so I, I pretty quickly understood, gosh, now I understand why productivity is a bit lower in January than it is in July. So you learn those kinds of things, but but maybe most importantly, gave me an opportunity to meet people. And, and that's just something I enjoy doing. I, I really like meeting people. I go out to our districts all the time. So just going out and meeting uh, some of our forty eight to 50,000 people is is probably where I see the most benefit in, in going out to the field operations. And Jim, just to build on that, you lead a very large workforce and uh, you've got a clear set of, of values that the organization stands for. But how do you set those values? How does it cut across an organization with a very decentralized workforce, as you say, kind of out on the street doing something very operational? What, what, what's your advice maybe for our listeners on that? When I first became CEO, one of the things that kind of a phrase that I coined uh, was people first. I, 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 I kind of stole a little bit from Herb Kelleher. I never met her, but he was the founder of Southwest Airlines. And, and he always talked about how uh, you have to have your constituents in a certain order. And, and that order for him, at least in, in his book, was your, his own Southwest Airlines people first. And then if they're they're if they feel valued, if they feel like they're making a contribution, if they feel like they're appreciated, then they will take care of your customers. And if your customers are happy, then your shareholders will ultimately be happy. And I thought that was, and he, and he said, it really has to be in that order. I, I would add two other constituents to our, to those three. I would add the environment and I would add our communities. I think we, so we really have five constituents. I always say the environment is kind of the voiceless constituent because it speaks to you in, in longer terms and it doesn't, doesn't call you or, or text you or email you, um, but when it's upset, it does speak to you uh, over over the long term. I, I do feel like though, people first is something that I've tried to really uh, make my legacy. If if I have a good legacy when I when I finish, and and I was asked a few years ago what I wanted my legacy to be, and I in front of a group of investors, I think they thought I was going to say, you know, double digit returns or or you know, uh, top top 5% stock price appreciation or something like that. And I said, I, I, I know I'm not going to be 100% successful. I'll be, I'll be happy if I'm 75% successful on making this a place where they really want to make a long-term career. But uh, I would say a lot of companies aren't, aren't even 50% successful with that. And, and so if I'm 75, then I'm ahead of most. The, the idea is that we, you know, not only will we pay compensation that, that we think is, is, a, is a, a fair wage, but it's so much more than just compensation. Uh, you know, I always say with, with respect to compensation, if somebody comes to, to me and says, you know, I love working for, for the company, but I have another offer and it's more money and I just, I, I, I just can't not at least look at that, that's a pretty easy fix. But if somebody comes to me and says, I, I don't feel valued here or I don't like who I work with, or I don't like who I work for, or I'm not getting, I'm not getting the right level of training, that's not as easy a fix. And, and so building that culture takes a long time. I mean, I, I would argue it takes, it's not measured in, certainly not measured in, in weeks or months. It's probably measured in, it's certainly measured in years and it might be measured in, in you know, decades, uh, building a culture where people really say they enjoy working there. And maybe just to, to build on this topic, the organization has this clear culture that you're constantly working on by the sounds of things. At the same time, the, the business is going through this massive transformation, if I understand correctly, Jim, because you're because of the whole sustainability agenda. How, how do you build that transformation and agility muscle, we might call it, across the workforce that maybe in prior decades weren't required to go through such a level of, of change? Well, one of the things we do uh, as, a, as a leadership team is really try and and look to the future, not just the next couple of quarters, but truly look out five, 10 years. And that's not something I think that comes naturally um, in our personal lives. I mean, you think about it, do you really, other than maybe your kids going to college or whatever, do you really look that far out typically? I mean, you're probably thinking, what am I gonna do next weekend? Maybe you're thinking about Christmas or Thanksgiving, but you're not saying, what am I gonna do in 2032? So. Um, it's not something that comes naturally to us, but we've really tried to kind of um, build that muscle a little bit, which is uh, looking forward 
the next five, 10, 15 years? And what are the trends going to be? And one of the one of the things that we saw as, as a, a pretty obvious trend that was certainly a, a natural for us was sustainability. Uh, you know, it's a big part of our business. It's a big money making part of our business today. It's not that we just have a you know, a director of sustainability who makes sure that, that the plastic goes into the recycle bin in the office, we actually have a very big percentage of our business that's tied to sustainability, and it's a big percentage of our earnings as well. So making investments in sustainability felt like a, a natural for us. And then when we looked at our um, renewable natural gas business, that's a, that's a byproduct of these landfills that we have. They, they, they naturally decompose and they produce gas. And so for many, many decades, we've been collecting that gas, and doing something with it. We've been turning it into electricity or whatever. We made this commitment a couple of years ago to spend somewhere between two and a half and three billion dollars on sustainability investments. And not only do our customers like it, but our 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 employees really like it. They like being part of a company that, that has sustainability as one of our primary objectives. Uh, our communities, of course, like it, and, and that voiceless constituent likes it, and then and then you know our shareholders like it. Um, you know, so so we feel like we're we're serving all of our constituents, and uh, at the same time, it's the biggest investment, organic growth investment we've made in the history of the company. Uh, Tara Hemmer is our senior VP that runs it, and she's doing a fantastic job. She's got all these plants under some form of construction, so. Uh, I hardly walk by her office because I know she's she's so busy. But um, but it, it is something that I think our employees can really be proud of, and and they are. I, you know, when I go out in the field, they're so proud of what we're doing on the sustainability front. And and that is clearly a deep passion for you and a and a central characteristic in a way of the company. But how did you strike the balance between leadership and followership there when it was when setting targets? How far do you go in stretching what the business can do profitably while leading for that silent constituency? Well, I do say that sustainability has to be both environmentally and economically green to, to be viable. I mean, we're not doing it for practice. And so sustainability has to, to strike that balance, as you say. Uh, and I think we do a really good job of making sure that that, that, that happens I was asked an interesting question on the recycling side about just a plastic water bottle. And I was asked, would you rather this go to a landfill or would you rather it go to a recycle center? And I, and I think her, when she asked the question, I think she, her, she assumed that my answer was going to be, I'd rather go to a landfill. We're a big landfill company. Everybody recognizes that. And, and I think there's this view out there that we are always biased to the landfill. We want everything to go to the landfill. And yeah, we do. We recycle, but it's just because we have to. First of all, I do think these big investments that we're making in sustainability have kind of blown up that, um, you know, that that misnomer bit. But, but my answer to her question was, look, I, I would even if I was completely agnostic about the environment, which I'm not. But let's just say I didn't care about the environment at all. All I cared about was earning a buck. I would want that plastic bottle to go to a recycle center because we make like, you know, ten times as much on on the bottle going to a recycle center as we do sending it to a landfill. And by the way, since I'm not agnostic about the environment, it doesn't really decompose. I think it does, but it's it's not going to decompose in our lifetimes. I think it takes 500 years for a for a PET bottle to, to decompose. Um, and we don't get paid a lot for it. It's very light. Uh, we typically get paid by weight. So so there's there certainly is a higher and better use for it outside of a landfill, and it's more economically um beneficial to shareholders if it goes to a recycle center. So, so that one truly is kind of a win-win for the environment and for uh, the, the economic side. And we've really made sure that we strike that balance. And on that, how do you link WM's undoubted success, both for profit and, and sustainability, to the wider picture? I mean, how is the world doing on the silent constituency? And where, does, where do you locate WM in that, that bigger effort? It's hard to say how the world's doing. I, you know, I mean, because some countries are doing better than others. Uh, you know, Europe seems to do better on recycling than we do in the U.S. Um, but I think the U.S. has done a, a decent job uh, overall. I mean, it's 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 a, a pretty clean country, and I, I think as a society we do we do fairly well. I mean, if I if I remember the old ads back in the you know I don't know whether they played overseas, but in in the 1970s there was a a Native American like chief, and he was standing there, and he had a tear running down his face, and he was 
and they were showing kind of pictures of, I think it was like Lake Erie or something with, with just the horrible pollution in the lake. And, and, and having spent uh, five uh, years in Pittsburgh, pretty close to Lake Erie, I can tell you Lake Erie is pretty clean now uh, compared to the, the way it was. And cars are so much cleaner burning and, and uh, landfills used to be just garbage dumps, for example. And now we line those landfills, nothing escapes them. So I would tell you we're doing pretty darn well as a society, um, but we can always aspire to do better. And, and that's, I, I think, whether it's taking care of the environment, whether it's running a company and, and taking care of show, shareholders, whether it's raising your kids. I mean, there's, I think it's natural to aspire to do better in everything we do. Uh, so I would tell you that, that we can aspire to do better uh, at taking care of the earth. And just a final point on sustainability. One of the things that's really striking reading the WM description of sustainability is it doesn't stop at the environment. That point you make about communities and the social component of this is there, that that commitment to spending equivalent of 2% of your net income on on social impact, as you call it. Where did that come from? Where did the, the, the motivation to do that come from? Big companies um, are such kind of a powerful force in the world uh, for, for doing good things, uh, if they choose to be, and, and, and so we choose to be. We choose to be a, a powerful force. Sustainability, of course, is, is maybe the place where we flex our muscles the most in that respect, but, um, but we also donate quite a bit to charities. We donate to a lot of kind of underserved communities uh, in, in multiple ways. And by the way, that that also benefits shareholders too. It's not just benefiting the recipient uh, of those of those funds. A lot of times, it's dollars, but um, but shareholders end up benefiting from that because in 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 those examples, the community might end up signing a contract with us, and so it ends up benefiting us in terms of our business or other companies that we do business with, like doing business with companies that are are um, um, you know doing doing good things for, uh, for their communities. So, so it does end up ultimately benefiting shareholders. And, I, and so I, I believe they're all interrelated. And Jim, just to build a bit on this point around communities uh, and broaden the point around social issues, we talk a lot on this podcast around leadership and when CEOs should and shouldn't weigh in on social topics. And there's been so many big events in recent times, and, and sometimes the US has, has led the rest of the world, frankly. What's your view on when it is appropriate for you as a CEO to give WM a voice on a topic and when actually it's better just to step back? I, I talked to a, uh, a friend of mine. This was during the, you know, there, there were three or four pretty tumultuous years there around COVID. And so I talked to a friend of mine from from uh, school and who's a CEO of a, of a much bigger company than, than WM. And, and he said, Jim, I I have a personal view of those issues, but I'm not the fourth branch of government. And I thought that was an interesting way of putting it. Uh, I, I'm not the fourth branch of government. Milton Friedman uh, said, look, companies have a, uh, you know, he, he was probably more singularly focused than most are today, but, but his view was companies have a responsibility to their shareholders. And, and so his, I guess maybe in his view is you have kind of one constituent. I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I do agree that it's not my place to to use our brand to further my own um, my own opinions. And I think you've seen companies do that and do it not very well. So what I try to do is is it's it is a little bit of a tightrope walk, um, you know. And, and I don't feel like it's my responsibility to say something. And some people might say, "Well, that was pretty wimpy of Jim to not take a stance on that." I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that criticism as opposed to having to losing this customer if I happen to take the wrong side of that issue. I, I have chosen or I've chosen to, to not take an, uh, a stance on a lot of those issues. Is there a defining moment, Jim, from your upbringing or your career that you would highlight that shaped how you lead today? I've told this story before, but uh, my parents were great parents. I think having great parents is so important. In, in our upbringing and our developments, they're both gone now. But they, but I always look back fondly on my on my upbringing. And and so I'll tell you a quick story about my mom. She used to take us to these little these nur- they used to be called nursing homes. Now they're called retirement homes. They're a little nicer now than they used to be, but they were kind of miserable places. And and it's almost where old people went to die. And and it was they were sad places. 
And so mom would take us to these little nursing homes. I grew up in Austin, Texas, and she would take us there and she would ask at the front desk, is there anybody that doesn't have any visitors? Uh, and, and then we would go and, and oh my gosh, we hated it as kids. It was, um, mom's dragging us. We always called it her little old ladies because it was always these little old ladies we'd go see and we didn't know them and they'd give us these hugs and everything. And, but in retrospect, they loved having kids come. They loved my mom. She would bring them, you know, birthday cards or, or a, a Christmas gift or whatever. And, and she didn't know these folks. And so I remember when my mom was passing, you know, she, she passed away 10 years ago and, and she was kind of uh, in her final days. There was a little old lady, her name was Magdalene Mays. And she was somebody that, um, it's even hard for me to tell this story. Um, so I asked my mom if uh, whatever happened to Magdalene Mays. And she was one of the little old ladies that we went to see. And she said, oh, she passed away. And I said, did you go to the funeral? And she said, I did. And I said, was there anybody there? And she said, yep, there was two of us. Oh. Magdalene and me. Oh, I can't bear it. I think what that taught me was that people are important. You know, this little old lady, I, I would guess that my mom lengthened her life by five years. By Magdalene had no visitors. I don't know whether she had a family, but mom helped helped her, you know, at least the last few years of her life live a, a you know, a life that she enjoyed. I'm taking my nine-year-old Jim, who's my youngest, to visit two 97-year-olds who have been very kind to me in my life on Saturday morning. That's great. Could I ask you uh, a couple of questions around talent? So one is, what advice would you have for young people starting out today with their career? Maybe one or two bits of advice that you would share with the younger generation. And then follow-on question is, what do you look for when you're spotting talent in senior leaders? Well, one of the pieces of advice that I give, uh, we have a 19-year-old and a 21-year-old. So they're kind of in that range where they're, they're in college, but they're getting ready to go out into the, to the real world. And I just tell them, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an old statement, but patience is a virtue. And, and I, I think that today's generation, I, you know, I've heard people say, well, Gen Z doesn't work as hard. I don't agree with that at all. I think Gen Z works just as hard as, as my generation or as your generation. I do think they're more impatient. I think Gen Z can, and, and part of it is, is kind of this digital world we live in. Everything's immediate. My advice typically is around that. It's around, look, be patient with your careers. Um, you, you know, things, good things will happen. You're in a great position uh, to, to, you know, there's so many people in this kind of retirement age, and you're in a position to really be able to, to move fairly quickly, probably move through your career more quickly than I did but don't expect to be senior vice president on, you know, day four um, of your coming into your new job. Give it time. Work hard at, at, at the tasks that you're given. And, and I think you will, uh, you know, the, the fruits of your labor will be born over, over a, a shorter period of time than, than you might think. But don't expect it overnight. Well, we end each podcast with some rapid fire questions to get to know you even better, Jim. So uh, we will ask a series of questions and you respond as quickly as possible. Well, I'm nervous now. <laughs> so which leader, living or dead, do you admire most? I, it, it might be, well, I, I would say Abraham Lincoln. What are the top three traits that every CEO should have? I think empathy is important. Uh, I think kind of ability to think more long-term. We talked about the fact that that's not something that's natural. And then I think, look, you have to have, you know, you can't be dumb as a rock. I'm not the world's smartest guy, but I think you have to have a little bit of, of intellect to, to be a, a good leader. Um, so I would say those three. What is your favorite way to decompress, Jim, after a long day at work? Well, okay, so after a long day at work, if you're just talking about going home um, for the day, then I, I do enjoy reading. Uh, I enjoy watching sports on television if you're talking about kind of vacation, I, I, I go back to going to the mountains. I enjoy going to the mountains. I enjoy, you know, uh, doing a little fishing or, or hiking or whatever. So it depends on whether you're talking about just at the end of the day or actually on vacation. What's the best piece of advice you've received that's stuck with you? So my father-in-law, uh, who he passed away about 15 years ago, and, and a union guy, 
a pipe fitter from St. Louis, Missouri. And, and so when I was moving out to our field operations, and I mentioned I, I, I spent eight, uh, seven years out in our field operations, and he said, when you go out there, don't just sit at your desk. He said, go out and, and, and really spend time with the operations folks. But he said, by the way, if you do it just once, then you're actually better off to never do it. Because if you only go out there once, then they're going to say, yeah, Jim, out, Jim came out here one time. I, we saw him, you know, uh, two years ago, but we haven't seen him since. That's, that's actually worse than never going out at all. So he said, if, you, if you're going to do it, then go out and, and do it on a regular basis. And if you do that, A, you'll learn something, and B, they'll really appreciate the fact that you're, you're coming out and, and kind of seeing what they do every day. So that was probably the best piece of advice I think I've been given in my career. Would you rather have regrets about actions or inactions? I, I would definitely rather have regrets about action. Then I would much rather say, I, I, you know, that um, I, I, I misstepped there. Then look back and say, gosh, I wish I had done this and I didn't do it. I, I would much rather be in, in the other court. What is one item on your bucket list? So I've been fortunate to kind of be able to take off a few of those bucket list items. I'm a golfer, so I've gotten to play Augusta, which was cool. Um, I, you know, one thing, and I'm not sure my wife agrees with me on this, but I, I think it'd be cool to, I don't want to climb Mount Everest. I don't, I don't want to go to the top, but I do think it'd be very cool to go to base camp. And finally, Jim, what's the most unusual item that you've collected in the garbage? I know that one of our team one time, I can speak for them, uh, they picked up a house one time and there was a, the lady, well, her husband was a World War II vet and somehow he had brought back a hand grenade from World War II and had it in the house and it was a live hand grenade. So they emptied the, they emptied the trash bin into the back of the truck and fortunately, this thing kind of rolled around on the bottom. It, it wasn't buried in the trash somehow because had they run it through the compactor, it might have, have actually exploded. But they they emptied it and they thought for a second, gosh, is this thing, is this like a kid's toy or is that a real hand grenade? And they called out a bomb squad and it was definitely a real World War II vintage hand grenade. Now, that I wasn't on that uh, truck that day, but uh, I, I can't say there was anything super interesting that I've collected, but... Um, but we've, we have collected a few interesting things. Jim, it's been a real pleasure talking to you uh, and a privilege. You've set out how you get to the core of a business, even if that involves going out in minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, how people matter to the way in which you think about leadership. You talked about that hierarchy of people, customers, shareholders, the environment and communities. And that's run as a seam through all of the answers you gave, both to how you're transforming WM, but also how you think about your role as a leader of the business and as a leader in the wider societies that WM serves. You're not the fourth branch of government. The business of business is indeed business. But when you think about your personal judgments on these matters, it's clear that the values that animate you are important and, and lead you to, uh, to make decisions about what it is you say and do not. And we'll all hope that Gen Z and the generations that follow them have some of the patience that you've advised them on. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much for, uh, for uh, giving me the, the opportunity to speak to you and, and really enjoyed it. And maybe, uh, maybe we'll grab lunch next time I'm in London. We'll show you a bin lorry. Perfect, perfect. All right. <laughs> All Jim, right. thanks for joining us and redefine us. You bet, take care. <laughs>